Welcome. Now. Welcome to part one of the colonial um, Hinduism book club, uh, actually meeting one. And then the first book that we're uh, discussing is part one of Rearming Hinduism, uh, Nature, Hindu Phobia, and the Return of Indian Intelligence by Vamsi Jalari. And today I wanted to discuss, uh, focus on two points. Uh, basically two passages. One is on the, the contradiction that he talks about when he talks about the, the first few chapters where you know they claim, on the one hand, they claim that we don't exist and Hinduism doesn't exist. Uh, and on the other hand, they also claim Hindus are responsible for all evil in India. So it's like, which one is it, right? You gotta decide. And I love that part. And the second part I wanted to discuss, which is more of the focal point of this is the passage when he talks about how colonial, colonial violence is portrayed as, as not violence, but as nature itself, you know? And that passage was so eye-opening for me. I feel like after I read that, I feel like I cannot unsee what I see now. Like I see it in all their, all the Western movies, the stories, the, even their news clips. It's, it's all like very, like very violent and like, and more importantly, dominating, right? It's all about domination. And like, I have no problem like, you know, like watching uh, gore or violence, uh, but when it's framed as uh, as a way to perpetuate a certain paradigm over and over again, then it becomes like a social programming, almost like a collective spell as well, or even a collective curse, right? Uh, because stories are how we perpetuate uh, uh, certain ideas and it's also how we make you know meaning you know out of life you know uh, an example even a very good example in real time is you know I saw a maze storytelling for slice of life and I just love the way you uh, juxtapose Hanuman's story with your son's story and it shows how Hanuman's story gave meaning to your life and to his life you know in a way that might not have, you know, without that story. And so that's how we process things anyways in general, that story is not how we escape reality, but really how we navigate reality, right? You're so right. I feel like yeah. I would have probably gone into a, a very negative, cynical mm -hmm. spiral if I didn't have a way to frame what had mm -hmm. happened, you know? Um, and, and I agree with you. I think the other thing I wanted to add to what you're saying is that um, it, it's a problem when all this violence and the domination is portrayed as natural. Okay. Whereas when you come from a different worldview, you're like, it, it's not necessary. It's, it, it happens, but that should not be the norm. And it cannot be, everything can't be excused away by survival of the fittest. And, um, you know, the, this, this alpha did this to this for, you know, and I mm -hmm. think that's, that's the problem with the, with the dominant narrative. And exactly. so the and so the the philosophy that deals in expansive inclusion, um, and that's the other twisted thing, right? It gets presented as the intolerant one, which is always gets me. I never figured that out. <laughs> but, but yeah, I I also like that how he touched upon it uh, at just right in the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, comparing the uh, the earlier um, colonial narrative uh, be compared with the Darwinism. So. Social Darwinism was part of the the, the egocentric Eurocentrism, which was uh, in one part he said it was not just Eurocentrism but the ethnocentrism, which was um, uh, helped by armies, the intellectual, the media, and the university power, and all through pervasive. So that Darwinism, uh, social Darwinism, and then alternative to that is also the narrative that uh, it they are still. Uh, uh, um, um, savages, but the noble savages narrative now. 
so the alternative is much more dangerous than the beginning because in the first narrative was about the pure hate you know it's coming from the place of the bigotry but the new academic narrative is so twisted that uh, it it's it tries to use that bogey of the you know this uh, um region reason a voice of reason has won over and it comes to have come out of the dark uh, ages and because europe came out of the dark ages you know everybody should have come out of the dark ages and you know <laughs> and then mm-hmm. uh, uh, how these uh, voice of reason are the things which will handle everything and then he goes on ex- gives so many explanations with the uh, with the dawkins at one place he talks about the dawkins how he rejects hindu view of creation is creation but uh, mm-hmm. in itself it doesn't see in itself it's not create uh, like we are not creativists or is it the right word creationists yeah creationists but it's not but actually reverse the gauge on them that this argument is itself is a speciesist mm-hmm. you know and so the story of the human evolution from, from number 1 from the story of the nature how it sees the world through the voice of reason itself is so problematic because it is looking at the nature as a machine as a tool and then also again there is a narrative of darwinism here you know there's one uh, species uh, once once over another because of the violence and other so violence is the narrative and it just percolates into the national geographic and also tv and everything so this myth how bad this myth is compared to the panchatantra story myth and you will laugh at panchatantra story myth because uh, the animals are actually talking but the, at the heart of it is is the idea that there is love and uh, wonder for the nature you know how it never it begins and uh, endless beginnings and the uh, endless ends uh, beginning of the endless uh, ends and what not so there is a this stark contrast how he gives it language because we have always learned, talked about how western world view is all about science and the how um, indigenous and indian narrative is all about the uh, reverence to the nature and everything but the way he narrates it into word into the words makes so much sense and it gives a new language to me mm-hmm. yeah yeah exactly in fact uh when from this perspective in retrospect i see that when jalari wrote the source of this intelligence and then the the sequel to the fire keepers of jala rumba which is part of their kishkinda chronicles trilogy which will be a trilogy the third one is now it's similar to the panchatantra narrative where he's trying to make sense of what has happened right because in riham and hinduism he even talks about how uh the colonial narrative sounds very much like an ice age narrative where it's influenced by the that weather you know the weather the, the trauma of having gone through an ice age whereas we in closer to the equator we didn't have an ice age so we have a, a kinder view of life and they've been so super imposing that ice age narrative onto us because in the past you know they used to see us as inferior like you said and and people on the right in the us still see us as inferior but now on the left they shifted into oh where the violent oppressors which is another way of uh trying to impose their reverse victim of narrative onto us because in reality where the victims where the ones who are experiencing a, a literal apartheid in, even in india in our own country hindu apartheid as well and, and even in my own country in myma my country of origin you know a lot of hindus were expelled uh, after the dictatorship took power 300,000 hindus were exiled and then those who were still in the country our businesses were seized our assets were seized by the dictatorship so it's it's been so that that kind of like genocide and expulsion is an ongoing thing for hindus all over the world right so and yet we're portrayed as violent oppressors even though we're trying just like the indigenous people here we're trying to advocate for climate change for coexistence with animals so in social intelligence he portrays these beings with balances he doesn't even call them tails he calls them balances uh 
to these monkey-like beings and Hanuman is part of them. Uh, and, and it's like a prehistory because these animals, these beings are coexisting. Coexisting to the point that even to shed blood is to call it a baradhar, breaking a Bharadharma, this rule, right? And that's how the story starts. Even to shed a little bit of blood is a very taboo thing in that culture. And then they meet these strange beings without any balances or quote unquote tails, which, and he never describes them as humans. We don't know who they are, like, but we just can deduce from the way he tells the story that they're the colonizer human beings that we know of today, where they are the ones who are shockingly violent, you know, like they they massacre these Ganesha beings, these elephants. It's one of the, the first encounters. And it's like, and it's like, why? And despite all of it, instead of like fighting back, like, and they do fight back eventually at some point, but even then it's done with so much restraint. And at the end of the story, like there is, you know, there's an attempt to heal them rather than to like completely dominate them. And that's kind of how like part one, uh, the first of the trilogy, Services Intelligence ends. Uh, and then, you know, there is a, a after the epilogue, there's almost like a, a new beginning with the cliffhanger so that he can get into the, the part two of the trilogy. But like, now I see that story, like that story makes sense on a whole other level because I read Rearming Hinduism. And I was like, oh, yeah, those were those beings without balances. Those were the Ice Age uh, beings that are now trying to colonize their the peaceful beings with their with the balances. It's a good way to so think about it. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I haven't read the book, so I can't comment about it. I just, uh, I can't make sense of it. Uh, it does it make uh, some commentary or uh, are an invisible myth or what? No, it's totally different. It's based on okay. the Haas regarding Hanuman and uh, the other two uh, monkey kings, there are uh, Sir Griva and there's another person. Valley, Valley. Valley, right. Yeah, Valley. So those, you know, those three people, right, in, in the Ramayana, it's kind of loosely based on that, but almost like before the Ramayana, what happened? He tried to imagine what happened before the Ramayana, like way before in the beginning. So it's almost like he's trying to create his own Ipihas to make sense of what's happening in the world today. So his hypothesis yeah. is that uh, the uh... Vanaras are some other species, not Homo sapiens? Kind of, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because this channel, <clears throat> one channel called 21 Notes, has done a really good uh, animation. And in one of mm -hmm. his episodes, he clears about what means Vanara through the uh, Valmiki Rama. And it's just a normal human being. It's just that they, they live in the in the jungle. And for the decorations, just like you see in the native culture, people put the bird feathers up. They used to put the uh, artificial tails. That was their custom. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. But uh, I think there's a lot of room for interpretation on Vanara. Vanara meaning, is this a man? Like almost like a question. And I think the way jewelry mm -hmm. envisions it is like, these are more more innocent, more close to nature beings. Whether they're human or not, almost doesn't matter. He just kind of envisions a, a society in which bloodshed is kind of really is a bigger deal than it is for regular human beings. And then, um, and then, and then it kind of goes from there, which I think is it's great. I think he did a wonderful job with that. Um, but it all connects to rearming Hinduism also because of the whole idea where. I guess when your when your paradigm is different, that everything the way you look at everything is different. So we can imagine a world in which we don't want to impose our way of thinking or our vision of God or goddesses on everyone else. 
Whereas, you know, religions that rely on conversion, they can't imagine a world like that. For them, everyone is wrong and they're right. And whereas we're like, the idea of coexisting, the idea of sharing and, and exchanging information, with, even when it comes to the divine, comes naturally to us. And the idea of converting someone out of their faith seems like, whoa, I don't, I don't want to take you away from your mom. You know, it's like, it's like a, there's a visceral like, whoa. And I think that's, I think he kind of, he addresses so many things in there, but I think that's a big thing I've just been examining that what we're struggling with is this narrative that's been imposed on us. Like, even when they look at the, when that dominant culture looks at the caste system, they see a system of oppression. Whereas we obviously reject untouchability and even caste difference, but we acknowledge that that was a way that society would have been divided. And it doesn't have to follow that there was this terrible hierarchy in which a few Brahmins were beating everyone else up, especially when we, you see the, the itihasa of how Brahmins are traditionally poor, first of all. <laughs> And, you know, it's just, it just doesn't fit with our, and that's, I think, Jewelry t speaks that a lot where something within us just doesn't, it just doesn't vibrate that way. When they say you're like this and your culture is like that and your faith, we're just like, wait, no, it isn't. <laughs> and I think that's what he, I feel like he did an amazing job articulating that, which I think I struggle with when I'm talking to people who are not, who do, don't come from a place of dharma or even fellow Hindus who are just either um, have, I can have internalized this hatred of the colonized, own. right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, and yeah, it makes so it much all. sense. It makes sense. Yeah, the the idea is not about that again. The speciesist, because I could not imagine him going that lane. No, uh, no, but about, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. He kind of, he kind exactly. of does it very delicately, and I thought that was yeah. that was very well done. And you see that Amarna okay. kind of deals in multiple species with with all these different intelligences, and I think that's also. Um, and now, you know, mm -hmm. science is coming to that. Science is pointing out that all these species have all these feelings that we have, if not more. Um, and so all this, you know, makes you look at factory farming differently. And, you know, <laughs> he answers, I think, a lot of modern day issues um, with that. I like in the beginning, in the first parts of the book, yeah. how he deals with the issues of migrant, the narrative, the, how migrant narrative itself mm -hmm. uh, can be used in some times and how it has been misused by, you know, by, oh, everybody is a migrant. That means, are you using it to whitewash your crime or are you making it to, <laughs> making it to actually, you know, address the issues that, you know, it does uh, in a, at a philosophical level that you don't need to associate because Hinduism doesn't necessarily all the time associate geographically uh, with the things, you know. And then he uses at one point that even a rock, if you look at it, you can trace back where a rock came from, you know, it just keeps going back. So mm -hmm. what's the point in that debate? Yeah, that's in parallel with the... But not taking away... Paradigm, yeah, right? yeah, but not taking away the struggle of the nativism. It's not an antidote to anti nativism. That's how mm -hmm. the, the new alternate uh, uh, academic twist is trying to do with the <laughs> shaming yeah, of exactly. the native. Yeah. Struggle. Yeah. Yeah. It's very pervasive. What they're trying to do is uh, paint everybody as an oppressor uh, and nature itself as oppressive and violent and dominating because they cannot imagine a world without hierarchies and domination. So, so even with the caste system, for example, in reality, uh, you know, it's the British who invented the caste system. They completely destroyed our Varna system, which is not even vertical, but horizontal. Uh, and people can actually change their Varna anytime. Like, you know, they would, of course, with the years of study and things like that. But if they feel like it, they can change their Varna. It's not by birth, you know, none of it was true at that time. But first of all, they, they're the ones who impose the caste system. And now they, again, that victim blaming, they blamed it on the Hindus because they cannot imagine a world without hierarchies and domination and that level of unprecedented violence. So even to this day, right, just like uh, with the Bounty Jolari example, even when they show uh, a nature documentary, they will show, you know, uh, a cheetah chasing a deer and they'll be like, uh, they'll dramatize it and sensationalize it, making it look like this is happening all the time, even though in reality in nature that might happen once or twice a day. This is not to say that nature in nature domination doesn't exist. 
In some cases it does, but it's their hyper-focus and obsession with it, that is the problem, right? And, and the fact that what the colonizers are doing is on an unprecedented scale, even with their, the factory farming, for example, when they're killing millions of animals, putting them in cages and killing them on an unprecedented scale. In a similar way, like they will say, oh, Africans are also own slaves, right? And they might even go further. Some people even go further and be, be like, oh, we're the ones who ended slavery, you know? So like we're effing superior and civilized. What they're ignoring conveniently is that there's a difference. Yeah, between hello, Disney. Disney. Yeah. Are you yeah, listening? Exactly. Did you end that slavery? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, they didn't. They still, they just put it in the prison system. They just changed it. So, there's a difference between like forced labor and chattel slavery, right? What the Africans had was forced labor. And what the European colonizers did was invent chattel slavery on an unprecedented scale where they treated human beings like property, not just the initial human being, but their children and their children's children and their that children's grandchildren and great grandchildren as property for 13 generations and 400 years. That's on an unprecedented scale. No other like, uh, group of people has ever done. But they want to absolve themselves, have that absolution, right? Absolve themselves of responsibility by creating that false equivalent and be like, oh, they were violent too. That's the narrative they're trying to push onto the Hindus as well, just as they did with the Africans. They want to say like, they really want to push this narrative that everybody did it, everybody fought wars, everybody oppressed everybody, so it's okay that they did it. They, they're trying to ignore on the, what an upper, unprecedented scale that they've done. So that's the big issue. That's the number one issue. The second issue is because they want to absorb the res responsibility, now they're like, they're pushing this narrative that, oh, since everybody does it and everybody does it, it's nature when it's not. That's basically what it is. Yeah, it's the classic Marxist theory of, you know, there is a, mm -hmm. there is a space, a, there is a phase when actually people do uh, make other people slaves. But that's not mm -hmm. true. When they look at the India's history, Megasthenes actually looked at it in 300 BCE and he said, no, there is no, no uh, slavery here in India. I mean, even uh, if, if there was any account, it's remarkable how free it was. And at one point, the one historian who wrote actually, wrote up actually about India that how uh, they, these guys don't even actually enslave the foreigners. <laughs> so surprised, like, why they do that? So yeah, I mean, sorry, you go ahead first because you need to leave first. No, no, I, I, love, I love hearing what you all have to say. This is fascinating. Yeah. And I wish I could keep going on. I just was not able to move my class. I have 12, 12 students that are waiting for me but um no i had a great um I, I had a great time hearing all these perspectives and i think it's nice to hear from people who think the same way especially when you see kind of how the media frames everything related to especially to to our culture but um all the kind of backwards twists that have happened um where um between you know kind of shove us into a narrative that just doesn't work for um, you know, for this for this philosophy and this civilization, so um, I, I will look forward to. Are we having a part two? Is that the plan for this, for the book? Yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have a part two uh, because now we're discussing part one, and then when everybody finishes the book, uh, okay. we'll have our a part two where we'll discuss the whole book as a whole. I look forward to that. No, no, I, I really do. I, I think this is, it's so nice to connect with other people who are reading this kind of stuff and, you know, all of that. So mm -hmm. it was a pleasure. Thank you. It's nice to meet yeah, you. Yeah, nice, yeah, nice meeting, Ami. Please join yeah. our workshop sometimes. Uh, I coordinate Hindu Parents Network and we do- Oh, are you the coordinator of that? Very, I was just on the website like a month ago and I'm like, oh, I told my husband, I'm like, this is really good stuff. Would love to. Nice, nice, nice. We put a lot of work in the resources and we are yeah. doing workshops for children and also yeah. for parents. So looking forward if you join. Absolutely. That would be great. That would be yeah. great. Thank you so much. So nice to connect. Gunan, as always, yeah. a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you.
Hello. So, the, oh, sorry. Uh, hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, since you have to leave too, uh, the last thing I want to do is because I want this to be part of the recording, I'll just uh, oh, read okay. uh, the passage from the book that we're discussing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really love the. Uh, so just go ahead. And yeah, just before you do that, I just really, I just wanted to say that I just really love the how his dissection of colonial modernity and how uh, he that uh, Western reason has triumphed over science, uh, over the religions, you know, and the features of modern uh, colonial modernity are they want us to believe it's a, it's just triumph and killing over the other. So the whole dissection is so beautiful. I loved it. that each species kills and fights. Okay, Kundan has left the chat. Anyway, wait for him to come back. Okay, I'll just read a few things I have highlighted here. The modern worldview cannot recognize the splendor of the devotional and poetic view of creation because it does not value the living. It is the machine view of the modern world. That is why at best it sees our gods too as primitive names for machine forces. Hinduism rather is biocentric. It is life immersed in itself. It does not presume to gaze over reality. It is not machinist. It is not speciesist. It is not anthropocentric. And another myth is that each species fights and kills each other until someone other, some other one wins. This is the most common way in which children learn about nature and natural history today. It was also not uncommon to apply a simplistic Darwinist notion of competition to the political realities of the day, placing European nations and races, for example, Kundan, since you are away, I started reading some of the uh, things I have highlighted here for the sake of recording. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I was having connection problems after I had to move. That's okay. So I'm just finishing yeah. the passage I was reading. So okay. it was also not uncommon to apply a simplistic Darwinian notion of a competition mm -hmm. to the political realities of the day, placing European no nations and races, for example, in a higher evolutionary level than, say, Africans and others. It was the age of social Darwinism and racism. The only thing, I'm just past, uh, reading the things I have highlighted. The only thing that dominates the picture we leave of millions of years of natural history is killing. Animated dinosaur films, exciting National Geographic wildlife documentaries, storybooks, games, Every story our culture tells today about nature, wildlife, and prehistoric life is constructed around hunting, mauling, killing, eating. Occasionally, the story breaks for mating, but usually after depicting a suitably bloody fight between suitors first. The last uh, quote I would like to add here is, compare Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain folk tales about animals, for example, with modern hunt and kill narratives. We may laugh at our animal stories and consider them kid stuff because the animals talk, but we don't even realize that is our culture. We recognize the sanctity of non-human life. And we see the similarities between motherhood, friendship, kindness, love in birds and animals as much as we do in human life too. Today's mass-mediated civilization though, with its pop science and pop Darwinism, we see animal life much like we would and an enter, uh, as an ent entertainment, a particular bloody video game, animals are seen like machine parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would like to read uh, page 85 and 86. Before I read, yeah. I also want to frame it that, you know, this is not to uh, exotify ourselves as, you know, these uh, passive, you know, magical beings uh, because we're not, we're human beings, right? And if you look at our, a lot of our deities, right? A lot of our gods and goddesses, they all carry powerful weapons, right? 
So that means that we do use violence and force when necessary, but only as a very, very last resort. That's why even in the in the Mahabharata story, for example, right? Before the Kuru Sikra war, the uh, Krishna you know, went to the Gauravs, right? To ask for just five pieces of land, right? Because they didn't want a war. They were like, they tried to resolve, you know, the injustices that happened. They tried to resolve it peacefully. Uh, only when everything, every solution didn't work, they finally had, you know, the Kurusikra war, even in the Mahabharata story, right? And even then, even then, right on the battlefield, Arjun did not want to fight, right? And then that's why we had the whole Gita, right? Uh, so I also wanted to frame that as well, that it's more about being uh, anti-domination, right? But it's okay to use the, the violence as a, as a very, very, very last resort. That, uh, <clears throat> that that's what this is about. So, okay, let's read page 85 and 86. So the world today does not name violence as violence. Instead, it calls it nature. This is one of the most pervasive, deeply held beliefs in the world today, reinforced tightly between the modern school curriculum and pop culture. We watch a children's documentary on insects. It goes through the usual narrative of birth, <clears throat> growth, competition, and mating. <clears throat> Then suddenly it culminates with a butterfly being devoured by another creature, shards of wing floating around the hall in 3D slow motion. We watch it a bit uncomfortable, but lacking the intellectual resources in a society that suppresses our natural ability to respond to it as we should. We only say, that's nature. We only say circle of life, as the pop culture, pop philosopher puts it in the voiceover. At best, we call it an inappropriate creative choice for a children's film. We don't call it a particular cultural, historical, ethnic view of nature, though that is exactly what it is, meaning the, the colonizer narrative, the colonial narrative. We watch a wildlife documentary of cheetahs chasing and killing and eating a deer. We forget that possibly happens once a day. For the most part, animals do not go around fighting and killing. They are playing, resting, exchanging affections with their own, not unlike, unlike how we do. Our natural intelligence may recognize that and lead us to describe them in simple human terms, like mothers and children, brothers and sisters, not unlike the ways in which folk tales talk about animal characters. But the exalted scientific narrative presses itself again. The narrative refers to the animals in the show, not as living beings, but as political players, the dominant male, the alpha, and so on, dominance might exist in nature, and so does violence. But it is a human and a cultural choice to focus on these and ignore the rest. It makes a specific social group's political choice to dominate others and to use killing as a way of life seem very natural. As human beings, as living beings, we know nature still but as the products of an exceptionally cruel phase in human history and thought, we lack the cultural permission to act appropriately. We go to zoos and not knowing what to do before unaccustomed forms of life's presence get awkward and taunt and tease the animals. Even when we don't, we only see the narrative that today's science gives us, the narrative of dominance and hierarchies. We only see dominance, we only recognize violence. That is what our culture teaches us to do, meaning the colonizers' culture. We see it's all survival of the fittest, though what we are witnessing really is better described as the propaganda of the cruelest. And that's that passage. Uh, I think you have to leave in a minute, right, Rishab? So that's a good place to end. Yes, yes, of course. Um, uh, beautiful way to end it, you know. And I'm looking forward to the second part, what he has to say in the book too. All right. Uh, namaste, Jay. Uh, have a great namaste. day. Namaste.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Bye. doing this, Kundan. Have a great day as well. Bye. You're welcome. All right, uh, AI slogan. I hope you were able to listen to most of it. Uh, anyways, you'll get the recording as well.